Hi, and welcome to EnviroCenter's Green Room. Meet the people on the front lines of climate action and find out what keeps them up at night. I'm Mandy, and this week we're joined by artist Sandra Sawatsky. She is the creator of The Black Gold Tapestry, a 67-meter-long film on cloth that tells a social history of fossil fuels that is a deep reflection on climate change and transition. Welcome, Sandra. We have a few questions for you. We ask all of our guests to bring one environmental fact to share. What have you brought with you today? Okay, so Charles Keeling, are you familiar with him? Okay, well, um, in 1958, a year after I was born, he was a scientist that started to collect data on how much um, carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere. And he did this in Hawaii. And that station is still there. And he was um, chronicling what was going on in the atmosphere starting at back in 1958. And um, at, by around 1962, um, he, they were using that information to talk to the government in the United States that, um, that the world was, you know, there was climate change happening. And ever since then, um, there, that information has continued to increase, and we're now in 2021, and um, we're still not really dealing with what's going on. And I think that uh, I just read the most recent, um, uh, I, on Instagram, I follow Greta Thunberg, and I was just reading her recent um, article that they've that she got from a, another source. And it's just that they're not quite confident that our net zero um, ambitions are actually going to are actually going to help us because it's business as usual. So it's a very interesting story. But I think just to realize how long we've been aware of what's going on and that we have, for various reasons, not done anything about it. Yeah, that is a, that is a really interesting fact to share that it goes back to 1957 and 1958. Um, okay, so the next very appropriate question then from that is, what climate problem keeps you up at night? Well, <laughs> I think it's more that my mind is whirling around during the day because I've discovered that I can, um, by being physically active every day and doing a lot of things, by the end of the day, I'm exhausted and I can't keep up awake. But during the day, I, um, I think it's because I'm aware of that there's so many different um, connections to this whole thing of burning fossil fuels and the lifestyle of um, North Americans and the European world and that it's also now passing on to other parts of the world in China and in India. Everybody wants to have this lifestyle that we have um, built around us and uh, I found a really interesting quote from C.S. Lewis are you acquainted with his books? So you yes, probably definitely. Have been yeah. So he had a very good point. And I think he was writing this around the late 40s, early 50s. And he says, if you go on for a few more centuries, wasting the resources of the planet on wars and luxuries, you will shorten the life of the whole human race. Very on point. On point. Talking way, way back when. So the, the dichotomy is that there are lots of people who are telling us that what we're doing is causing problems. But when you're in the pot, you don't notice that the temperature is rising. And that is our, there's a real um, disconnect between being told something that's going to be good for you and actually taking action because in the short term, it doesn't seem like it's actually going to, you know, it's not going to be good for us. We're going to have to stop doing things that we like to do. And uh, that is really difficult. And there's all these social elements to, to, to do with that because we're a, um, we're 
trained at a very early age to be competitive and to uh, we, we compare ourselves to everyone around us and we want to know where we stand and in order to be considered to be respectable you have to have certain things that will tell people that you're respectable you have to have nice clothes and you have to have a good house and you have to have good hygiene and there's all these other things that keep going and every everything I've mentioned requires inputs to have good hygiene to have running water to have hot water to have all those things so it it's um it's very difficult to take separate all those things out and somehow change our lives so yeah, that is very true. So mm -hmm. given that disconnect then that you were talking about, what in your opinion is the solution? Well, <laughs> if I had a solution, <laughs> would, uh, would people listen? I think um, I, when I was doing the tapestry, as I was doing it, uh, I had to face my own you know, what am I doing? What if I, what if I, you know, what can I do in my little, you know, stinking life? I'm one person out of billions of people on this planet. And I have lived a middle class life from, the, you know, the day I was born. My, my father was first a school teacher and then he was a salesman of insurance. Um, we grew up in a house that was, um, just under a thousand square feet. We started off with one car, a second-hand car, and then as time went on, we, get a, we got a new car, and then eventually my mom got a car, and then we move out from that family home, and then we all get our own places to live, and all those things. So I, um, I had to think about, okay, what, what can I do? And I think as a young person, there's many times where I had to you know, you have to make, um, have to decide what it is that you want and, out of this life. And it's, we all pay lip service that we live in a, you know, a world full of objects and things and, and that we, um, you know, we want to, I guess, separate ourselves from the material world. But um, in order to achieve what you want, what is it that you have to give up to get what you want? And if you, we want a world where, um, wherein we are paying attention to that um, decarbonizing or, you know, figuring out a way to live like that, then we have to, I think we all have to make, um, make changes to our lifestyle. And it's going to be hard, but maybe there's a way to make it attractive. So we have to then look at the people who are you know, the people we look up to. And I think it's up to, I think it's in that world that, that um, you know, monkey see, monkey do. And if somebody that you admire is doing something that is making those changes, then we might uh, be more influenced to make changes in our own life. Yeah, certainly. Leading by example is a is a really good way to bring upon mm -hmm. change, I think. Yeah. Um, and there's one one other little thing mm -hmm. as I, I was trying to get to is that I started to do little, little things that I could do that don't seem to amount to much, but maybe they do. Um, I stopped using Kleenex. Now, most people use Kleenex. I happen to have... Um, a very healthy fluid nose, like I was constantly blowing my nose as, a, you know, depending upon what season it is. And so I started to use handkerchiefs and I at first made a few of my own, but then I found that you could uh, find handkerchiefs in secondhand stores. Usually they hadn't been used because people stopped using them a long time ago and they used to be gifted to them. You say the same way that you might gift, um, I don't know, all sorts of things. So I started to use handkerchiefs and I've been doing that for about seven or eight years. And I, um, the, uh, the amount of 
Kleenex that I used to have to, like, you know, I'd go through a box of Kleenex probably in two weeks. Don't do that anymore. And the, um, it seems small, but it was something that, you know, means fewer trees. And I was just thinking, so if everybody was you having a reusable handkerchief, I know that my daughter at first was like, ooh, that's disgusting. But then you just kind of just, you know, it's like underwear. You just, you know, each day you get a, you know, a new one and then it all goes in the wash and that's, there you go. And then pens, I have fountain pens. So fountain pens don't end up, you know, usually when you buy a pen, it's, um, you know, something that will be thrown away when it's empty. So I go through a lot of pens. So I found that fountain pens, you buy one and it will last for years and you just have to buy the ink and that too can last for a really long time so i those are little things but i then as you do the little things you do are the bigger things and i have made a, a lot of changes and they're just little adjustments and i can tell you that a fountain pen i don't know if you can see it is a it's really lovely and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they're, they can be very personal, like what you like in a, in a pen. And uh, the same thing with handkerchiefs. Instead of having that, you know, that stupid box there all the time, you can have lovely handkerchiefs. You can embroider them. You can do all sorts of things. So I think, I think we just need to make being reusing much more attractive and also easy because we're lazy. Oh, certainly. Yeah. And those are two really great examples that add up over a lifetime. And if you're talking to your friends and family about doing that, then they're interested in making the change and then it ripples from there. So yeah, yeah I think that's really great. Um, next question is what's in the way? What's in the way? Um, well, because we like to think of ourselves as rational, but we're not. We're emotional. So all the things that we and emotional and cultural and all the things that we are our identity are things that get in the way. I think, you know, we become really, I was just thinking that um, years ago I worked uh, in the film and television world and I went down to um, Texas where I was had to do some a shoot, it was a one day shoot. And can you imagine? I flew in a plane for one day of shooting down there, and that is another thing that kind of like when I think now, it's like it blows my mind that that's what we were doing. But anyhow, I was working with a woman who um, uh, was getting married. She had just gotten married, I think. And uh, we were comparing and uh, our, our, our marriages, like, so I grew up, I you know, got married back in 1976 and um, the wedding was in our backyard and there were 70 some people and that was, that was pretty much it, it was very low key. And um, she was from a Muslim family and it's a five day event and there's a lot going on and there's much um, you know exchange and there's um, being hospitable is a huge part of their culture and I just like thought oh my god that's just crazy the amount of you know outputs that are being going into that wedding but that is cultural so we you can't make judgments like that. Like I, I was just like, I, I come from a bunch of Mennonites and you know, if you didn't reuse everything, you know, a million times, you, you know, that's what, that's what I grew up with that mental state of being, you know, be very cautious about what you, um, what you use and not, and to, you know, make, and also um, grew up in a family who my parents had both been children of the, the 30s the, and so everything was um, a lot more um, you know being conscious of what what you had and what you had to had as in terms of resources so I think we have a lot of there are so many things that are in our way and it's not just you know if it was logical if we were logical I'm sure we would have made all the changes we need but I don't 
there is a lot more playing out and being human is complicated. And so I don't know what the answer is. I, you know, other than I'm recognized that, um, I mean, if we can appeal to people's egos, if we can appeal to their desire for, um, you know, having some standing in the community, uh, if we can appeal to their identity, um, all the things that probably without even knowing are the, how we actually make decisions. I think that's, um, that's possibly a way forward. It is certainly very complicated and multi-layered. <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving on from there, how can people help? How can people help with the, okay. So one of the things I've noticed is that, uh, during the COVIDs, we are mostly at home. Now in my circle of friends, if we try to get together, it t usually takes quite a bit of planning in order for everybody to be home and around in order to get together. And because of COVID-19, people are at home and around and they're, you know, sort of at a loss as to what to do with their time because they're not traveling as much. And so I think that the um, being home, being in your community is um, an asset for the communities that we live in. And if we get bored enough, we might actually start um, participating in our community uh, instead of just with our own friends. We might actually start doing things within the community wherein we get to know other people and they may not have the same ideas as us, but just like in the workplace, just because you aren't the same doesn't mean that you have, don't have to work together for a common cause. And so um, here in Alberta, I don't know if you've, you've probably seen a few of the headlines about coal, but I think um, the furor over coal mining in Alberta wouldn't have been nearly as great if people were traveling the way they did pre-COVID. That's because they have all the time now to uh, you know, spend a lot more time reading about what's going on and uh, getting themselves involved in other ways. So I think those are, I think uh, staying home more, not traveling as much, um, is, is a good, a good start and uh, participating in your community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, doing certainly. things with, mm -hmm. Community can have a, a huge impact on people's decisions, what they see their neighbors doing, what they talk to their neighbors about, where they shop, you know, where they get their produce from. Yeah, it can have a big impact. Um, so to end on a positive note, uh, what is the good future? What is a good future? Well, coming out of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, a good future would be people restrict their traveling, uh, dedicate their, some of their time to their community, reaching out to people that they don't agree with, but finding ways to have conversations. So when I made the tapestry, my thought was that it would be a conversation starter for people from all, all sides of the conversation that has to do with um, uh, climate change. And it had, it did have that effect. I was really, um, really felt good about when I would go to the gallery, um, the Glenbow, when it was up, it was up for eight months. And it was astonishing how it's sort of like a talking stick. You see an image and then you could see people having these conversations around what was there. And the work wasn't intended to divide people, but to show us what happened. I, every image that's in there, I used references, visual references, anything that could um, support this timeline of what has happened. And um, that's, it's really important that we figure out ways to um, 
responsibly engage with each other. We're, you know, none, I'm no more important than anybody else. I'm, I'm just a grain of sand in the sea of life. So I think if we find more ways to take action in our personal lives, and of course, if you, when you want something and you start to actively engage with going after that something that you want, it becomes more important and there's a feedback loop. And so if you care about your community, I mean, anyone that you've ever talked to who's been, become engaged and actively engaged in something, it's because it starts off as a, you know, a thought and then it, you take a few actions and before you know it, you're, you're full on in. And I think that's where it starts is that every one of us, every one of us can do something and don't look for somebody else to, to do it for you. That's it for this week's Green Room. Thanks so much for joining us as we get to the heart of climate action. You can find out more about our work and sign up for our newsletter at enviocenter.ca. See you next time.